we've got a lot of uh, experience in this room. And so for those of you who have come just to make me feel good, now's the time to tune out. You can take a little bit of a snooze. I want to thank Professor Huang for his very kind introduction. It was most thoughtful of you. I want to thank Pa Liu, who's also here as an organizer, Professor Yuan Ming, who is one of the most talented and thoughtful uh, and beautiful people I think I've, I've ever met. Um, and also to Jan Barris, uh, Jan and I hung out, I don't know, 20, 25 years ago. Do you remember that, Jan? When she was putting some deal together that brought together young people from the United States and young folks from China. Uh, it was in Colorado where we sat uh, behind closed doors for two to three days to try to figure each other out. And there was Jan as the empresario explaining it all. And it was very, very useful. And uh, I'll never forget uh, those days trying to crack the cultural code and to break certain barriers. I, uh, I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, my daughter is here as well, who I wanted to make sure you all met. Uh, her name is Gracie, and she comes from right down the road, a place called Yangzhou. Gracie, you want to stand up, sweetie? <laughs> as, as you can tell, she's not in the least bit shy. Uh, but I like to tell her, <laughs> it took her a while to figure that one out, but now she's, she's got that one spot on. Um, it's really an honor to be here with members of the Barnett family. And I can't tell you what an, you know, it's one thing to say, you know, you're humbled around friends, old friends who are sitting here. It's another thing uh, to be in the presence of a great family uh, that dedicated their lives to uh, this very important pursuit of better understanding China and uh, the role of uh, the United States and China in the world. And uh, so for, you, for Eugene Barnett, it's a pleasure to be with you. Martha, welcome. It's a pleasure to be with you and some of your other family members. Uh, Doak Barnett, I never had a chance to meet him. Uh, was always a giant in my mind growing up because he wrote the literature. He kind of wrote the theme, the background music for a lot of the work that we did as uh, young China people. Uh, one of our nation's leading scholars on China, born right here in Shanghai in 1921. He dedicated his life to developing stronger links between the United States and China. And he said something at one point in his life that I think is something we all ought to embrace. Said he, I am far less impressed by what I have learned over the years than about what I still must learn to understand China. When I read that, I thought that <laughs> my, my feelings exactly, and I think that is a worldview that is a refreshingly humble insight, quite frankly, and one that every China, so-called China hand and China scholar ought to embrace. Students at Columbia University, he was instrumental while at the National Security Council, as mentioned, uh, earlier in formalizing the U.S.-China diplomatic relationship between many players, not least of all Secretary of State Cy Vance, National Security Advisor Zbigniew Brzezinski, and our then liaison director, uh, Leonard Woodcock, at the East-West Institute in the mid-90s. We sat alone in his office, and all I remember was the flood of questions coming at me uh, from Mike. Now, the objective of my being there was to learn from him. And it soon dawned on me what one of Mike's secrets of success was. First, I walked out of his office feeling a little bit taller, thinking such a giant actually wanted to learn something from me. But that was Mike Oxenberg. And I think, truth be told, it was Professor Mike Barnett, always learning, always thinking, always probing. I'm delighted by this introduction and the opportunity to be with you here this afternoon. It is my last public address as U.S. Ambassador to China. And so given that, it carries certain uh, pangs of emotion with it as well, because Mary Kay, Gracie, and our entire family have absolutely loved this, the most exhilarating two years of our lives now gone, now gone by. It's particularly great to be in Shanghai. I have fond memories of my countless visits here over the years, 
I stayed down the road at the Jingjiang Hotel in 1984 when I was helping to prepare President Reagan's trip to China. At the time, Deng Xiaoping was in charge. Jiang Zemin was a local politician. The Peace Hotel was a hangout for a local party cadre. And Pudong was nothing more than a collection of rice paddies. We went to visit it. It was called the Rainbow Commune no longer. During that visit at the Jingjiang, I wandered down to the original Chinese Communist Party auditorium. You remember the one that used to be there. And imagined what it must have been like to be present when President Nixon and Premier Zhou Enlai signed the Shanghai Communique in February of 1972. From where we stand today, it is easy to forget just how turbulent that time was. The scars of the Korean War remain fresh in our nation's memories. China had lost 400,000 of its men, including the son of Mao Zedong. The Vietnam War was still raging at the time of the Shanghai Communique, and China was a half dozen years into the Cultural Revolution. Balance of power politics and the threat from the Soviet Union provided the spark, that resumption that would, that would create a resumption of contact. Our shared strategic interest in a secure, prosperous, and peaceful world transformed that initial spark into a robust bilateral relationship. Now, the first months and years of our warming relations were very much guided by a mixture of pragmatism and optimism. Nothing about U.S.-China relations was preordained back then. And the prospect that in just three decades, this relationship would become the most high-profile, important bilateral relationship in the world was virtually unimaginable. But that is where we find ourselves today. Thanks in no small measure to the tireless work of visionaries, some right here in this room, some like Doak Burnett, Michael Oxenberg. These are the individuals and others like them in both my country and here in China who had the audacity to see potential where so many others only saw limitations. They had the wisdom to see common interests where areas of disagreement were so much more obvious. And they possessed a unique determination to push the relationship forward despite the strong historical and ideological currents running against them. Their efforts were aided immensely by the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, a driving force for the development of this relationship. The committee's fingerprints can be found at every historic point, from ping pong diplomacy in 1972 to subsequent exchanges between artists, academics, and subnational leaders. And for that, we are grateful. Today, from the vantage point of the heights to which these predecessors have brought us, I would like to share just a few observations on the path forward for the United States and China. We have come a long way since 1972, but more will be required of all of us if we are sincere in our commitment to elevate this bilateral relationship above and beyond our current challenges and help both countries truly reach their full potential. Three decades ago, not even the most optimistic idealist could have predicted how fast and how far relations between China and the United States would develop. The frequency of interaction between our two great nations, whether official, academic, scientific, or commercial, has been unprecedented. Habits of cooperation have formed that have brought the best of both of our nations together for the advancement of common interests. To personalize this a bit, I hardly visit a corner of this country with the, without seeing evidence of this common interest in the work that each is doing. I saw the fruits of our shared efforts on HIV AIDS prevention when I visited a joint U.S.-China facility treatment facility for HIV negative injecting drug users in China. Inside the clinic, 
I spoke to a recovering heroin addict, one of thousands who are helping to break free of the horrific cycle of addiction and abuse and destructive behavior from which both countries are learning important lessons. I know from visiting the Yushu earthquake site on the Tibetan plateau last year that U.S. humanitarian assistance has saved Chinese lives. When we traveled there, we walked the streets of what had once been a thriving community, stood next to the ruins of a Buddhist monastery, and listened as one man after another would tell us how his village had been destroyed and its culture threatened by the devastating earthquake. I also saw families eating food provided by American relief workers and children using school supplies donated by the United States Embassy. I have seen U.S. and Chinese experts work together to improve public health and prevent pandemic disease outbreaks. 20 years ago, more than a million Chinese babies were born with severe neural tube birth defects like spinal bifida. That's almost 300 babies a day. But more recently, Chinese doctors working with researchers from the United States Center for Disease Control conducted one of the largest studies ever on spinal bifida could save and improve thousands of lives. The results were as stunning as they were indicative, up to 85%. And the lessons learned have become the gold standard for prenatal care around the world. Growth in both countries, projects that would have been more difficult to do, quite frankly, just on their own, like carbon capture and sequestration, demonstration, pilot plants, and I know that when the financial tremors shake world markets, the United States and China come together to stabilize the international financial system. When urgent needs loom or major crises strike, like it or not, the eyes of the world now turn to the United States and China. This is not to say that alone the United States and China can solve the world's problems, but it does mean that unless our two countries are committed to work together, and finding solutions for global concerns, it will be much more difficult for all of us to find a way forward. And so my challenge, our challenge, is to find ways to strengthen habits of cooperation between our countries for the benefit of our citizens and for people far beyond our borders. Now, although the logic of our shared destiny should compel joint action, it doesn't always work that way. Too often, divisions dominate our discourse and sap our ability to work together. Of course, it's natural for two countries to have differences, and our differences on some issues are profound and well-known. It should come as no surprise, for example, that the United States will continue to champion respect for universal human rights, which is a fundamental extension of the American experience and a bedrock of our worldview. Long after I depart Beijing, future ambassadors will continue to visit American citizens like Dr. Feng Shui, who was wrongfully convicted of stealing state secrets and is now serving an eight-year sentence in prison far from his family, wife Nan, son Alex, daughter Rachel, all of whom are in the United States. They will continue to speak up in defense of social activists like Liu Xiaobo, Chen Guangchun, and now Ai Weiwei, who challenge the Chinese government to serve the public in all cases and at all times. The United States will never stop supporting human rights because we believe in the fundamental struggle for human dignity and justice wherever it may occur. We do so not because we oppose China, but on the contrary, because we value our relationship. President Hu and Premier Wan have both acknowledged the universality of human rights. By speaking out candidly, we hope eventually to narrow and bridge this critical gap and move our relationship forward. At the same time, I know China has also strongly held views on certain issues that differ from ours, and it would be a mistake for us not to listen to their opinions and try to understand the Chinese perspective. We not only need to listen, 
but we also need to hear each other. Cutting off dialogue and suppressing the news media does not help us understand each other. If specific differences, no matter how sensitive at the moment, are allowed to define the entire relationship, then we all suffer. Instead, where we have differences, we owe it to ourselves and to future generations to speak respectfully, as equals, but also candidly and honestly. And the best way to do this is to maintain a constant dialogue at all levels throughout the highs and yes, even the lows in our relationship. Turning the relationship on and off in reaction to unwelcome events is inconsistent with the objective of a positive, cooperative, and comprehensive relationship that our leaders have set out to achieve. Canceling meetings is a sign of displeasure and will not encourage greater respect for each other's views. Avoiding direct engagement on sensitive issues will only undermine the respective interests of both our countries. We cannot move forward, ladies and gentlemen, if when differences emerge, only one of us is fully committed and fully engaged. Global challenges will not pause to wait for upturns in our bilateral relationship. Just the opposite. They will only worsen while we remain disengaged. Challenges like financial instability, transnational crime, and potential nuclear proliferation by Iran and North Korea are real. They threaten both of us, and their solution demands our continuous joint efforts. Cooperation is not a concession, but rather a sign of confidence. Confidence in each other and confidence in our shared ability to strengthen the global economy, to improve the health of the global environment, and to promote peace around the world. I believe that as China continues to move in the direction of the political and economic reforms that some Chinese leaders have articulated so eloquently, its sense of confidence will only grow. And as that confidence grows, so too will our ability to work together. This is my hope. This is my expectation. And it is also, I believe, imperative. Because just as cooperation can create a virtuous cycle, an absence of cooperation can produce the opposite effect. But how do we encourage a positive evolution in our relationship that is durable and sustainable? First and foremost, leadership will be essential. And it will soon fall to our younger generation to provide that leadership. Today's leaders may struggle with the legacy of outdated ideologies or past differences, but the next generation in both countries will carry with them a profoundly more global outlook. These future leaders will need to be as far-sighted about the bilateral relationship as those that have come before them. Just as before, the future direction of U.S.-China relations is not preordained. It is in our hands and soon will be in the next generation's hands to guide, to shape, and to lead. They will need fortitude to avoid the temptation to blame the other country for the challenges they face. They will need confidence to think creatively and act boldly. They will need vision to focus attention on the shared benefits of a cooperative U.S.-China relationship. And they will need determination to develop the relationship even during those inevitable periods of bilateral tension. I have had the distinct honor as United States Ambassador to China to meet literally thousands of teenagers and university students in every corner of this country. I am particularly pleased to see some of China's youth here today. And I hope they will forgive me for offering some humble and unsolicited advice. You see, I believe there is a very good chance that some of you, seated right back here, we met earlier, one day will be helping to lead this country. And I'm certain that you and your cohort will have a profound impact 
not only on the people of China, but on the people of the United States and indeed the rest of the world. So as a former businessman, former politician, soon to be former diplomat, and perhaps most important, 30 year student of this relationship, I have four simple recommendations for you as you focus on the broader, more bedeviling challenges of US-China relations in the years ahead. Number one, invest in people-to-people -people interaction. iPads, iPhones, Twitter, and all the other new technologies that are beginning to define the way we communicate are only tools, and they cannot replace real-world relationships. We cannot rely on even the most advanced communications technology to improve U.S.-China relations today. Only people can do this. Because in the end, it's good old-fashioned, heart-to-heart, and mind-to-mind -mind, mind -mind contact that takes us beyond the headlines and helps deepen trust. Increasing people-to-people -people exchanges between our countries is the most important long-term investment, bar none. The more that Americans get to know China and vice versa, the broader the support will be for the continued development of this relationship. For in spite of the immense scale of our relationship, the simple fact remains, individuals, including all of you present today, shape in some way U.S.-China relations. In order for our relationship to have the strength to advance shared goals, it cannot exist solely between governments. It requires the involvement and support of every segment of society. So use the technology and tools we have available to us today, like the internet, but use them to share information, increase understanding, build relationships, not to erect barriers or foment distrust. Number two, respect culture. Our two countries have different histories, customs, and political traditions that inform how we engage each other. We all should appreciate this fact and dedicate more mutual effort to cracking each other's code, so to speak. By understanding the elements of our two societies that influence and inform our behavior, if we want to communicate a shared vision for the future, we need first to appreciate how much our different histories, culture, geography, political systems impact how we pursue our goals today. Number three, humanize the relationship. Your generation will have the technology and the reach literally to bring the bilateral relationship into the home of every American and Chinese family. When you do, I hope you do it in a way that highlights the benefits to better understand how they directly benefit from us, citizens increasingly will be in a position to make their feelings known. Number four, tackle misperceptions, an aura of reality, and even shape our policies toward each other. At base, misperceptions are fed by a lack of mutual trust. As you reach positions of authority, you all in the back of the room, be brutally honest with your American counterparts about China's concerns and aspirations. Trust is born out of such honesty, and ultimately, trust will be the fuel that takes this bilateral relationship to even higher heights. Later this month, I will return to the United States, but our work will continue. The bilateral relationship will keep evolving. Challenges and opportunities will continue to emerge. Others will watch our every move as well they should. As I prepare to step down as U.S. Ambassador to China, I leave this country more certain than ever before that there is no relationship anywhere in the world that is so full of potential as this one. Potential to do good if we focus our energies. Potential to disappoint if we let those opportunities pass us by. We should set our sights even higher. Working together, the U.S. and China should help relieve human suffering in regions of the world unreachable by others. We should strive to find cures for diseases like cancer 
and AIDS. We should lead the world in innovating clean energy technology that create jobs while improving quality of life. Together, we should be lifting the world. There is so much to do, but so few who can do it. Those of us who are able need to stand up and make a difference. I have every confidence that the U.S.-China relationship is poised to meet the challenges and opportunities. It is all made possible by first understanding each other even better than we do today. This is something we all can embrace. Thank you all very much for having me. Um, now we turn to uh, Professor Yuanming. Before she gave her remarks, I will give a brief introduction of Yuanming. Yuanming, Beijing Daoxue Guoji Guan Xuan Jiaoshou, Jian Guoji Guan Xi Yan Jiu Suo Suo Zhang, Meiguo Yan Jiu Zhongxin Zhu Ren, Di Jiu Jie, Di Shi Jie, Di Shi Yi Jie, Quan Guo Zheng Xie Wei Yuan, Quan Guo Zheng Xie Wei Si Wei Yuan Hui Wei Yuan. 中国人民外交学会理事，多次应邀参加瑞士达沃斯世界经济论坛、美日欧三边委员会等。一九八三到八五年在加州伯克利大学进修，八九到九零年以高级访问学者赴牛津英国牛津大学做研究，一九九三年赴美国乔治亚卡特中心任高级研究员。一九九五年担任美国卡内基国际和平基金会、布鲁金斯学会高级研究员。一九九八至二零零四年任美国亚洲协会董事。二零零四至二零一零年任美国纽约外交关系委员会国际顾问。二零零七年当选为联合国基金会中国董事。著有大量的著作。其中有《中美关系的沉重一页》、《跨世纪挑战》、《国际关系史》等。下面我们欢迎 Professor Yuan Ming。Mr. Hartman, colleagues, friends, it's my great, great honor to be here. As Jan Jan Barris said. I did change my schedule. I should be in Macau instead of Shanghai. But when I got this invitation from my dear friend Huang Renwei, I told myself I must get this because Doug Manet, Mike Oxenberg really mean so much to me. I told Jane in my email, I said, this belonged to my heart. Jean, I remember, in, it's very fresh in my mind, in the early 90s, Doug took me from my hotel in Washington, D.C., all the way to Virginia, your early residence, and you cooked such a delicious dinner for me. <laughs> and Mike Ossenberg, whom I had the honor to work on many projects, just one memory, also back to the mid-90s. In Tokyo, when both joined this uh, trilateral commission conference, Mike walked to me, very seriously said, Yuan Ming, Dr. Kerry, Harry Kissinger is here. You got to talk with him on U.S.-China relations. And uh, Mike arranged that private room and I did also Ambassador Lord was there. So we have so many things that's the importance of U.S.-China relations. So I look very much to this great opportunity to listen to Ambassador Huntsman. I used Ambassador Huntsman to speak through from memory. I didn't hear so. Actually, this really, really is such a place for me. I grew up here before I went to Peking University in 1962. High school, just one block and a half from here, from Fort Stevens. 
on Tongqi 94. Just there also two blocks from here. In this way, I didn't hear Computer, 95, almost 95. Shikongjiang University or Shanghai University is American Missionary University. So graduated the Pearl Harbor. And she walked all the way from Shanghai to Chongqing, the capital. And I'm talking on the joint. What change, change of my personal life? This is really very touching. And we got to think about world politics, world history. We, we live, all live in history. And also our personal stories. Those personal stories with this age, this world, the combination of these really, I think it's a very precious lesson for the later, for the future generations, for the young people on both sides of the world, United States and China. And I really think Ambassador Hutzman touched upon many important issues in his speech. And I would like to just focus, I think, two of the points he delivered. I take from his speech those main messages. One, I feel, as Ambassador mentioned, that we should always, I, I'm not quoted here what he said, but I, that's my understanding. We should always pursue our common interests, the extend the common grounds where Americans and the Chinese interests really in, and try our best to work on the future, as Ambassador touched upon, the global economy, global environment, or health of global environment, and the peace around the world. That's so important for the future of mankind. In the United States and China, we have to work, address so many important issues. When we fully re realize the differences between us, we have to address those differences or disagreements by dialogues, by communications. For example, human rights, as Ambassador touched upon. This is so important, and we have working, have been working so hard on that. Ambassador, you visited, as you mentioned, Xinjiang, Gansu, Yushu, and other places of China. You can see those people there, the leaders, the people, all working, try the best to improve their livelihood. And achievements, it's there. Everybody can see that. If you work there, if you uh, take a trip there, I've been traveling around, and I think I was really impressed. And that's a basic improvements of our human rights here in such a big country for so many years and especially in the last three decades when the reform really bring such a profound changes in China. And we are still working. And also for this kind of, a, in Chinese, I believe in Ambassador Huntsman's speech, the strong message of Chiu Tong Chun Yi, I don't know what our translator put that in a very standard English, but I try to uh, interpret this as always pursuing the common interests when we fully realize the, dis the differences. 
and try to talk, to communicate, to have dialogues. Sort of a Chinese political or philosophical principle really rooted deeply in our tradition, in Chinese history. That's how Chinese, this civilization, survived thousands of years. It's the nature of human life. We have to live with dif differences when we have much more in common. How? So different kind of agenda because the historical difference, the cultural difference, or the political backgrounds, if you can put everything in. Just from the last summit, President Hu Jintao went to the United States and met with President Obama and reached very important consensus. The ambassador, you know, much, much, much better, much more than me. And secondly, I think Ambassador Hutzman really bring up very, I think, very impressive. He, he is very modest, he said, well, try to. But I really share these suggestions, advice, or views to promote people-to-people -people interaction, respect culture, and humanize the relationship, personal, personalizing U.S.-China relations. It's so important. And also tackle misperceptions. And I would like to take this opportunity to share some personal, personal stories. Like among these four, personally, I really like respect the culture. I think it's so fundamental. It's so crucial. It's, and it's not easy. It's not an easy work. I, uh, I'm going to tell you, uh, actually, my, one of my stories. I just lost it. This time last year, um, my uh, academic elder brother, Ms. Minister or Ambassador Li Zhaoxing, called me up, said, Yuan Ming, Dr. Kandi Rice is coming to Beijing, and do you have time to join us for dinner at Diao Yu Tai, at State Guest House? I said, of course. I, was, I make a note on my calendar book. And he said, why don't you get a friend who can play piano and who can speak English? Well, I think, I said, well, I do have a friend there. A young lady grew up in Xiamen and got her training later in UK and a very good pianist, and said, I, I'm going to invite her. So when the dinner started, my young friend, Chinese young friend, start play Chopin. And the Dr. Kandi Rice just sat, sat next to me, and I could tell she, she really, she got, she really enjoyed. And she listened because Dr. Rice plays piano so beautifully. And she enjoyed. That's on Chopin. Then my friend, this young pianist, said, Dr. Rice, now I'm going to play another piece of Chinese music on piano for you. And she, what she played called Cai Yun Sui Yue. It's like a moon night, but it's a beautiful moon night, that kind of thing. And I could tell Dr. Rice was so taken. She was so taken. She said, oh, Yuan Ming, I never heard Chinese music on piano. And it's beautifully done. And afterwards, Dr. Rice just said, she said, could I get a note of this music? Well, I said that this music actually is from Professor Wang Jianzhong here from Shanghai Conservatory of Music, a professor of piano. I said he did not only play like uh, th this one and like a beautiful moon night, but also a lot of pieces from lo the, those Chinese music we call the local 
uh, Ming Jian, the folk Chinese music, but put that on piano, that's so touching. So uh, two weeks later, when I went to Stanford and had meeting at Hoover Institution, Dr. Rai's office at Hoover Institution, I gave her the notes and she's, oh, I'm going to practice this. I just love it. So this is really, I think, very amazing and made sort of a music even more beautiful, more rich. That's, you can make life better. So I really share Ambassador's remarks with, and it's not easy. Another personal experience for me, like two or three years ago, I also got this kind of invitation as a speaker and for an American audience, or the very uh, successful. Well, I, I'm, I'm happy to do that. But later on, I got another top, this assignment actually, in very concrete Chinese, uh, English, said, your topic should be on yin and yang. I got lost, yin and yang. That uh, sounds very Chinese. It's a very uh, typical sort of a Chinese culture, uh, traditional culture. And then, I got the, the second notice, said, you should mention Beijing as Yang and Shanghai is Yin. <laughs> I said, I couldn't do that. <laughs> How can you say Yin and Yang, America is Yang and China is Yin, can you put that? <laughs> then I almost, I almost turned down the invitation. I couldn't because the culture as Ambassador said, misperception. It, it's, it's so, because the, the two cultures have different kind of a roots, cultural roots. We have, for some of the years, we Chinese live this side of the world. We develop such a sophisticated system, terminology, language, almost everything. And then on that part of the world, like my grandpa told me when I was a child, they dig a hole all the way down, that's the United States, and vice versa. <laughs> but how to explain such a complicated, sophisticated, very deep-rooted Chinese culture to outside, it still remains a big challenge for us, I mean, people. Chinese, first the language, we got to speak English. And when the language turned into, from Chinese origin turned that to English, sometimes it's lost its original meaning. Not that many people like Ambassador Hartman speaks Mandarin fluently and sometimes Shanghai dialect, different dialect. Not that many people can do that, but how? can we really introduce ourselves? Or oh, finally, because I have so many friends in that group, I couldn't say no. I try my best to st stand on the stage and try to, try to uh, tell some my knowledge on yin and yang, but certainly not Beijing as yang and Shanghai no, is yin. Certainly not that. But I'm, I'm going to work on that, I think, Many young people in China, my students at Peking University, and I believe many uh, young people around will join me. But I just raise this here, how these two great nations really build up very successful channels to communicate with each other. I thank you all. Thank you, Professor Yuanming. Now we open the floor to the questions and answers. And uh, I would like any of you to raise questions. Okay, you first. Uh, yeah, please. Uh, 
First of all, welcome to Shanghai again, Ambassador. My name is Richard Xu, a PRC licensed attorney of Shanghai Pioneer Law Office. Uh, in comparison with Professor Wong, I'm only a NGI, which means non-governmental individual. So I prefer to ask you a question in English so that Mrs. Huntsman can understand my question correctly. Uh, to my best knowledge, do you have to report to President Obama after you return to Washington, D.C.? <laughs> if this is the case, what would you like to advise President Obama in the further enhancement of Sino-U.S. relations? In addition, are you going to share your ambassador experience in China with Ambassador Gary Law, who is coming soon. Thank you. She heard it clearly. And if I misfire on this one, I'm likely to hear about it all night. So this is also uh, a situation where you have to be a little patient with me. Because as a diplomat, you're supposed to say something when you have nothing to say. and say nothing when you have something to say. <laughs> You're always kind of between a cliche and an indiscretion of sorts. <laughs> so I promise not to find my way to either one of those. Let me start with uh, Gary Locke, with whom I have communicated uh, several times by phone, who is uh, a trade and uh, commerce expert. Having served as Secretary of Commerce for a couple of years, I've had the good fortune of interacting with him uh, on a fairly regular basis since trade and economics is such a centrally important part of this relationship between the United States and China, $400 billion worth. So I think he's going to bring a level of expertise in, our, in a centerpiece issue that will be very important for this relationship longer term. He understands the relationship. He has a compelling family story about their roots in Shanto uh, that uh, I've heard over and over again. And when I've traveled with Gary, Secretary Locke, down to Guangzhou, he's treated more or less as, as a rock star, if I could put it that way. Uh, uh, Caleb Cushing did, and negotiated the Treaty of Wangsha, which was patterned after the Treaty of Nanjing and, uh, and, and the Imperial Court here. Uh, it's interesting to see that the issues we worked on, and Ira Kassoff will get this part, the issues we're working on today are not far different from the issues that Caleb Cushing worked on in 1844 in negotiating the Treaty of Wangsha, which in a sense was patterned after the Treaty of Nanjing in that it opened concessions and markets for U.S. goods and gave extraterritoriality to American citizens who were transacting business as well. So from a consular standpoint, and B will appreciate this, uh, it was the first of its kind, uh, really. So you had, all the way from our first ambassador who had been an attorney general before coming here, to people like uh, Thomas Gates, who replaced uh, George Bush in 1976, who had served as Secretary of Defense and Secretary of Navy uh, before coming here for a year or so. So it, it, it isn't without, uh, without precedent. Uh, but I think it carries with it uh, an extra level of symbolism because the portfolio that Gary Locke will be carrying is commerce and trade, and that is critically important to this relationship. And I know Brenda will be the first one to be placing a telephone call uh, to him. Uh, in terms of advice that I render, uh, we render advice all the time. And I'm guessing that uh, at any moment in the day, uh, the White House is pretty much able to tell you where the embassy is coming out in terms of uh, our own recommendations and forecasts for the relationship. Uh, I think it's, you know, the challenges ahead will be to see how we can, how we can not just maintain cruising altitude, which we've done a reasonably good job of, but gain additional altitude. And I would argue that in order to a, a gain additional altitude, you have to have a relationship that is based not only on shared interests, but also on shared values. So our shared interests, we can enumerate, and we talk about the economic interests, the security interests, 
uh, the, uh, the cultural interests. But I think we need to work on our shared values even more going forward. And that is kind of what gels the relationship longer term. I think the, the interests, be they economic or otherwise, will likely come and go over time. What will cement the US-China relationship is a firmer foundation uh, uh, based on shared values. And that, I think, will take us to even a, a higher uh, level of cruising altitude. And that should be a goal that we shoot for in this relationship. I think it's also going to be very important as the year plays out. And nobody knows what kinds of events will transpire during the summer months and beyond. But the one thing I've grown to appreciate and live with in this relationship is there's a certain level of variability to the US-China relationship. It has its highs and it has its lows. We somehow have to figure out how to take the edges off the relationship. So when we have something between us that transpires that uh, one side or the other doesn't like, uh, we're able to compartmentalize it, which we haven't been able to do fully or successfully, I would argue, in 31 years of our diplomatic relationship. Allow the experts to deal with that issue, that challenge or that problem, negotiate a solution while we uh, are able to maintain a broader focus on the big picture. So we never lose sight of the role that two countries on the world stage are supposed to be playing when you have uh, global economic turmoil like we face today, when you have regional security issues like we face today, uh, when you have the ability to really speed up the creation and the deployment and commercialization of new technologies like those around clean energy. So the future is out there for the U.S. and China to grasp. We just have to make sure that some of the fundamentals are sound. And part of that, again, I would argue, is speaking not past one another, but with one another in ways that are clear, in ways that are honest, in ways that are respectful, in ways that also suggest that the words we use are being processed. Our words are used, and we think that people understand the meaning or the term uh, in the American or English sense only to find that it kind of was interpreted differently. So I think there's a lot to the communications piece, but always ensuring that there is honest and frequent uh, and forthright debate and discussion. And I, I love what uh, Professor Yuan Ming said about the importance of communication. Uh, she, she made my remarks sound as if they were important and coherent, and I appreciate that very, very much. But on the communication side, I think a test of uh, the strength of our relationship is our ability to speak openly and honestly about issues that sometimes cause one side or the other to cringe a little bit. When you don't have a strong relationship, when it isn't based on a solid footing, you can't speak openly, and you can't speak in a direct and forthright fashion. I think it is a proof of, of a strong relationship that we can sit in virtually any ministry in Beijing and have a very open, comprehensive, and frank discussion. They don't always end the way that we'd like to see them end, but we get our messages through to one another. Now we've got the work ahead to see if we can get to that higher cruising altitude. And I think all the experts in Washington, the experts here, would agree that we have some goals to shoot for that are achievable if we manage this relationship properly going forward. Thank you. Next question. Next question. Yeah, this guy. Uh,大师先生,你好。那个,我是来自复旦大学美国研究中心的张家栋。那个,我对你刚才提到的这个促进年轻一代相互交流非常感兴趣。我不知道我是不是属于你讲的年轻一代。但是我发现,在中国,比
，很少与中国学生在一起相处，在一起喝酒，在一起打牌，在一起游戏。那么这种交往好像很没有深度。我想从你再知道一些，采取哪些方法能够促进这种交往向好的方向发展，向深度的方向发展？我从监委员看你就是还是很年轻的，呃，那个人不要忘掉。嗯 ，I'll I'll I'll never forget the enduring image of、uh, of President Reagan when we made the stop here in 1984. And 那个时候我也是很年轻。We went to Fudan University, and、uh, President Reagan met, of course, the Xiaojiang, the president,、uh, a Yale graduate,、uh, and、uh, walked into the auditorium. Unforgettable speech, and I, all I remember seeing—well, I remember hearing a couple of important things,、uh, like the importance of、uh, nuclear disarmament, which、uh, most people have long since forgotten, coming from、uh, President Reagan. But I remember people, students, hanging out of the windows.、Uh, so interested were they in capturing、uh, this view of of an American leader, and it was、uh, it was one of the truly remarkable experiences coming out of Fudan, a truly great、uh, international. Uh, university, you know, it's 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 going to be increasingly important that we solidify and gel、uh, relationships among our young people, because that's、uh, I would argue where、uh, a real basis for understanding and trust really does begin. And let's let's face it, you know, the fuel that fires this relationship is trust. And when you run out of trust, which can happen very very quickly, you sputter out, and you've got to somehow figure out how to fill the tank once again,、uh, and The trust building that I'm referring to is taking place on college campuses and among exchange programs, represented by some pretty outstanding young people、uh, right over here. So we have a choice when our young people meet: we can either kind of put down our,、uh, our our perhaps more visceral reaction to the relationship, which is to say, be on defense,、uh, and begin to understand、uh, our commonality. Uh, which I try to do whenever I go around to a group of young people, or we can sit and fall back on stereotypes and argue about what U.S. policy is responsible for, and our students can then argue, you know, what、uh, Chinese policy in the region might be doing or economically do to harm America's interests. I'll never forget when I was at Qinghai University, which is a little bit like Wyoming.、Uh, it's out in in the rural parts、uh, of the country. Population five million,、uh, a million of whom are Muslim, not in Wyoming, but、uh, but in Qinghai. <laughs> and、um, I stood before a group of students, and one student got up and started、uh, laying into me about、uh, our support for Japan. And this was right after the the Senkaku, the Diaoyu Tai incident, and、uh, you know the laundry list of all the American ills, so on and so forth. And then he sat down, and everybody clapped. And I was up there all alone. You know, I'd just been taken apart, and people were cheering. And I said, my response was, you know, I can go into any American university, and I can find a student who can stand up and give us say the same anti-China rant, and everyone is going to stand up and clap. So what are we going to do? Just clap at each other, stand up and point fingers and clap back? That's not the point. We've got to、uh, mitigate some of our differences through a deeper understanding, and my solution was this. And I don't know if any of you agree with this or not, but America is an easy target, and because of that, I think we've learned to grow a pretty thick skin. We've been a world leader for generations, and when you're a world leader, you get picked on a lot,、uh, and you get pointed out、uh, as being responsible for every woe in the world. And my response was, I think we in America are kind of used to that. Wherever you go, you'll find people on the world stage who are willing to kind of point out the、uh, the inconsistencies or the,、uh, the the policy mistakes of America. But the thing that's different today is China is now on the world stage and playing、uh, a, a a a much different role in world affairs, or I would argue will begin to play a much different role in the years to come. Economically and from a security standpoint, I mean, for heaven's sake, China just successfully rounded up 33,000 of its citizens in Libya successfully and brought them all back、uh, by using organization on the ground and heavy lift aircraft. 
uh, something that I haven't ever seen happen uh, by China in a, in a third country. Uh, China increasingly will play a role in the world. I don't think it has a choice. It is on the world stage, and when there are issues, difficulties, and challenges, the world can only look to so many players to help resolve the issues. And that means China increasingly will get involved in international affairs, and it means as a result of that, people will begin to criticize, and people will begin to pick on you, not just the United States, but China, just by virtue of its leadership. And that means you, as young students here at Chinese universities, need to grow a thick skin, just like we've had to do in the United States. They didn't quite know what to do with that response, but uh, it, <laughs> it, it, produced a, it produced a pretty lively debate. So I would say that um, these programs that we see represented here through several universities are really a wave of the future. If we are, in fact, successful in getting 100,000 students from the United States here to China to study, where now we've got 120,000 from China in the United States. Now, the number one position recently has taken over from India uh, as the number one country with students studying in the United States. I have no doubt the trajectory is good. We'll have the numbers that will really matter. We have the programs. We have the interaction. And that gets to your second point about uh, the compartmentalization of youth. You can find yourself on a campus, you can find yourself in a dorm room, you can find yourself online only talking to your own people. And I think we just need to fall back on that old advice given on a university campus many years ago, and that is, it isn't my space, which refers to that mode of communication that young people use, it's our space. And if we can somehow remember that, indeed, the world increasingly is our space, not my space, selfishly, but our space, and we're going to have to learn to deal with it more practically and realistically, uh, then I think we'll be okay. But uh, your points are well taken, and I appreciate very much the role that Fudan University plays, not only in trying to better understand my country, because I know you do that very, very well, but also in the generation of young leaders that you are preparing uh, for leadership uh, and, and roles of responsibility in the future. Thank you. Do you have any American friends raise question? Okay. Obviously, given your position as the U.S. ambassador to China, you're coming at the U.S.-China relations from a very American perspective. And your lecture reflected that in the sense that you, you raised uh, certain, certain issues that, that China perhaps needs to work on, for example, human rights. But I'm wondering if we could turn that around a little bit and ask, what could the U.S. learn from China? Like, what, especially uh, given our deadlocks in the U.S. currently over budget, over future investments, over the economic crisis, what should the U.S. Be, be looking to China for? Thank you. The reason that I kind of went through my laundry list of four points at, at the very end was to help uh, illuminate the need to uh, it, uh, ensure that we are somehow cross-cultural. And to be cross-cultural, it means that you do have to understand uh, certain realities of the country with whom you are dealing. So in this case, let's just begin by geography. Uh, and the reality uh, of being in this part of the world, surrounded by 15 nation states, all of whom are in different stages of development, some are uh, outright basket case countries, and what it means in terms of your desire and need for stability and predictability to keep everyone together. And uh, I thought Yuan Ming hit on one of the more important points that does differentiate us and probably is lost on a lot of Americans, and that is to better understand why there is a drive for predictability and stability, why that is a core tenet of Chinese policy, where we live with a certain unpredictability that comes with freedom. Uh, a lot of countries are just not willing to embrace that. So um, you have the geographic setting, you have history, 5,000 years versus our 240 plus years, uh, where you have the longest uh, surviving civilization, one from which we can learn a whole lot. We have the longest surviving founding document in the Constitution uh, from which uh, I think some can learn. Um, 
And, you know, I think also understanding um, the role of the last hundred years in China. I think for Americans to drop themselves in to the impact of the last hundred years on the average citizen uh, here in China is something that would probably change a lot of opinions and attitudes uh, for my country. So if you go back to the Boxer Rebellion, 1900 or 1901, and bring yourself current, and look at all the ups and downs, all the uh, invasions, upheavals, revolutions that have occurred in 100 or 100 plus years, and why that then has resulted in the need, the drive for predictability and stability. I think a lot of this is not totally understood by people uh, in my country, in the United States. So the hope is that for each issue that we bring up, whether it's freedom, democracy, human rights, open markets, not picking winners economically, um, so on and so forth, there is a flip side to every one of those. And I think in order to have a balanced and intelligent debate that we in the United States need to understand each of those flip side, uh, flip side issues uh, so that we are able to manage a relationship that does bring into focus truly a future that does speak to uh, respect and equality between the United States and China that I think increasingly will be a part of uh, getting things done. Thank you. We have last question. This question for the ladies, because we have three gentlemen. Okay, lady. It's my honor to have this uh, chance to listen to uh, Your Excellency's lecture on China-U.S. Uh, relations. Actually, uh, my question is uh, related to local government exchanges. Uh, you mentioned a lot of people-to-people uh, -people exchange in China-U.S. relations. I think uh, uh, from uh, President Hu Jintao's visit to U.S., we, we see that a very important new dimension of the mutual exchange between China-U.S. relations is local government to local government uh, exchange. And uh, you are very successful uh, governor for Utah. Uh, could you give some advice to to, uh, for example, Shanghai municipal government, how to uh, promote this, uh, this exchange with uh, U.S. Uh, counterparts. Thank you very much. Brief, because I know everyone is waiting for dinner, and this is a very dangerous place to be in that case. I think local government exchanges will probably be our most fruitful level of interaction in the years to come. So as opposed to the U.S.-China relationship based solely on Washington and Beijing, New York, Shanghai, but really Washington, Beijing centric. I think we're going to see the proliferation of subnational uh, relationships driven by governors and driven by mayors. And the reason I say that is because increasingly a lot of decision making uh, is, it has devolved to the more local level. But the issues that I think are, uh, are most uh, salient and, and pronounced in politics these days are, are really based at the local government level. I mean, increasingly, it's, uh, it's affordable housing, uh, it's water quality, it's air quality, it's economic development at the local level, it's development of educational systems, it's health care and delivery of health care, even to rural areas. This isn't uh, a Washington and, and, and Beijing set of issues. This is where governors, as we have seen increasingly when they come to town, they want to sit down with provincial governors and party secretaries to exchange ideas and to actually learn. You can learn both sides. Huxiang Bangmang, Huxiang Xueshi, Gotong Jinbu, economic issues that governments work on around regional security, around people to people exchanges, uh, and, and several other sort of uh, issues driven by uh, national government. But increasingly, I think you're going to see uh, a lot more in the way of relationship building, which I think over time is going to be very good for the U.S.-China relationship. Because at the grassroots level, you're going to see a much different dynamic. You're not going to read about people talking in cities that you can't quite relate to, talking about issues that perhaps uh, are well beyond your ability to, to comprehend the subject matter, uh, if you're just an average player out in Sichuan. But local government leaders who are in your area, problem solving around the issues that do affect you individually. And so I'll just end by saying this. I mentioned in the speech that increasingly we're going to have to humanize the U.S.-China relationship, bring it down to earth. Uh, it's very large. It's very compl complicated. It's, it's abstruse. And it's hard to follow. And because of that, sometimes you'll pick one issue and you'll drill into that issue. And uh, you'll see kind of the, the, you know, the, the far edge, extreme shades of that issue. I think increasingly, 
this need to humanize the U.S.-China relationship, which is to say that people on both sides, in every village, in every town, in every home, in every hutong, they're going to have to better understand the benefits they get from the U.S.-China relationship. I think that's, that's a given. And I think that understanding truly is going to come from more subnational work between mayors and governors. We have the, uh, the mechanism now in place of the party secretary from Hunan. Uh, secretary uh, Zhou was just at the National Governors Association meeting. Uh, we'll have the first group of uh, provincial uh, governors and party secretaries who will meet at the next, uh, this summer, uh, uh, National Governors meeting. And they'll spend time in a room, maybe an hour or two hours, talking about uniquely local issues. This is the first time this has ever happened before. And I think it, it is completely appropriate, given where we are uh, in the U.S.-China relationship, and I think it is probably one of the most exciting uh, and potentially fruitful aspects of our engagement. Thank you.